Book of Heaven, Volume 22, Part 6 August 4, 1927 There is no greater happiness than a king who serves his queen and a queen who serves her king. When the divine will reigns, it is like the beating of the heart. Example of Father and Son I was feeling highly afflicted because of the usual privations of my beloved Jesus. But as usual, as this pain is, it becomes more intense and ever more harsh, to the point of rendering me petrified. Now, while I was as though immersed in the sea of this pain, I was given a refreshment, and in that ice-cold water I looked at the will of He who kept me tortured and yet loved me, as He had prepared that refreshment. And as I was bringing it to my lips, Jesus moved in my interior in the act of stretching out his hand in order to sustain the glass to help me himself to drink saying I am serving my queen she serves me who am her king and I serve her who is my queen in fact one who does my will and lives in it is always ready to do what I want. Therefore she serves her king faithfully and in an admirable way. And since my will is in her, I serve my own will that rendered her queen. On hearing this, I burst into tears of unspeakable tenderness, and I thought to myself, Queen, Queen, and he leaves me so alone and abandoned to the point of letting me reach the extremes. And then he comes up with something new to leave me for even longer. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, do you want to make fun of me? But while I was pouring out my sorrow, he moved again in my interior and added, My daughter, I am not making fun of you. On the contrary, I tell you that there is no greater happiness than when the king serves the queen and the queen the king. And if the queen were to be infirm, if she saw herself being served by the king, sustained in his arms, being fed the food by his hands. For there is nothing that the king does not do for her, allowing no servant to come close and serve his queen. The infirmity would change into happiness for the infirm queen. And in seeing herself being touched, served, sustained, watched over by the king. She feels as though his love were giving life back to her. If this happens in the natural order, that a king is happier to be served by the queen, a father by his daughter, while the daughter was served by her father or by her mamma, and this because the king, the father, the daughter, have love as the first act in the service they offer, and would want to give their lives with their services. And this is why they are made happy in their pains, which does not happen with servants. And this is why the service of servants is always harsh, much more so in the supernatural order. One who lives in my will is my queen, and her first act is love.
and in all the acts she does, she gives me her life. Oh, how happy I feel in her acts, because those are the acts of my very will that serve me. And in seeing you infirm because of me, I feel happy to serve you in the very things created by me, wanting to give you my very life in each one of them. And in giving it to you, I feel my happiness being doubled, because I feel my life in she who possesses my will that made her a queen to me. Not so when the things created by me serve one who does not do my will. These are servants, because they do not possess a royal will. And oh, how hard it is for me to serve servants. If a king serves his queen, he does not degrade himself. On the contrary, he acquires glory and heroism. But having to serve servants, what sorrow and humiliation. After this, I was following the acts in the divine volition, and I thought to myself, what an impression have the privations of my sweet Jesus caused on my poor soul. I no longer feel those fervors, so ardent of before, but everything is coldness. Oh God, what a double-edged knife is your privation. With one edge it cuts, with the other it kills, and with its cuts it removes and destroys everything, and leaves such nakedness, even of the holiest things, that one can just barely live, and only to fulfill the supreme volition. But while I was thinking of this, my beloved Jesus moved in my interior, telling me, My daughter, yet everything you used to feel before in your interior entered into the order of ordinary grace. Fervors, sensibilities, are ordinary grace that I give to all according to their dispositions and that are subject to interruptions, to now rising and now dying. And therefore they constitute neither life nor solidity of sanctity. On the other hand, in my will, I have invested you with extraordinary grace, which is firmness in good and incessant act, Virtues that are exclusively divine. Do you think that your continuous round in the works of your Creator is something trivial or ordinary? The firmness of your will in mine, only to follow the acts of my eternal will? In the face of my will, Fervors, sensibilities, have nothing to do with it. They are like little lights before the great sun that have no reason to exist. And if they do exist, it is for doing nothing. My will absorbs everything and makes the soul become all of God who wants to make of her another son. One who is son wants everyone to become son. It would not be something worthy of it to form little lights. It would go out of its nature. And you are there crying over the little lights 
and do not think that a sun invests you, giving you firmness and unshakability. More so, since when my will reigns in the soul, it is like the beating of the heart that has the primary act of life in all the members. It is like life, motion, strength, heat. Everything comes from the heartbeat. If the heartbeat ceases, life, motion, and everything else cease. Now, as my will beats in the soul, it beats and gives divine life. It beats and gives its incessant motion, its strength that is never exhausted. It beats and gives its inextinguishable light. How beautiful it is to see the continuous beating of my will in the creature. It is the greatest miracle that exists between heaven and earth. It is the perfect order between creator and creature. With the soul in whom the heartbeat of my will reigns, I act like a father who keeps his son always with himself. He communicates his ways to him. He feeds him his words. He would want to palpitate in his son in order to give him his intelligence, his life. And when he is sure that his son is another him and can do what he knows how to do, he says to him, My son, go out into the field of life and do what your father has done until now. Work. Take care of our businesses. Take upon yourself the whole commitment of the family. You will be the repetition of my life, and I will rest. I will accompany you with my heartbeat, that you may feel within yourself the life of your father, and may carry it out faithfully, as I wait for you in my rest, to enjoy together the fruits of your toils. More than as father do I act with the soul in whom my will reigns. Rather, a father cannot give his heartbeat to his son, while I give it to her. I keep her always together with me. I teach her my divine ways. I communicate to her my secrets, my strength. And when I am sure, I fling her into the field of the life of my will, that she may take on the whole commitment of the human family. And I say to her, My daughter, let me rest. I entrust everything to you. But in my rest I will wait for you often to enjoy the fruit of the work you do in the kingdom of my will. Don't you want, then, that your Father, your Jesus, may rest while you work in my place, but always with my heartbeat? And I, my Jesus, but you almost no longer tell me anything, and not only does it seem to me that I have to work alone without you, but I miss your word that lays for me the way that I must cover in the kingdom of your will. And Jesus added, My daughter, my word is life, and when I speak, I must see whether this life can have life in the creatures. If it is not so, I do not expose a divine life of mine if there is no one who receives and it is enough for me to see even one single creature disposed to release this divine life from myself within my word. 
And this is why many times I do not speak, because I do not see anyone disposed to live the life of my word. More so, since with you I have no need of words to make myself understood, it is enough to look at each other in order to understand each other. Isn't it true? You understand me, and I understand you. August 9th, 1927. How creation and redemption are divine territories given to creatures. The love of Jesus in making her sleep. How light and heat are inseparable from each other. I was following the divine will in its acts, and my beloved Jesus followed me with his gaze to see whether I would visit all of his works. And he told me, My daughter, I am watching to see whether you visit all my territories. You must know that creation is a territory of mine. Redemption is added territories. Even more, my childhood, my tears and baby wailings, my prayers, my works, my steps, my hidden and public life are as many apartments of mine that I formed within my territories. There is not one thing I did and pain I suffered that I did not use to expand the boundaries of the divine territories in order to give them to creatures. Now every day I look at whether at least the little daughter of my will visits all my territories and enters each of my apartments. And when I see you begin your round to visit the sun, the stars, the heavens, and the sea, and all created things, I feel that my territories, that with so much love I formed and gave to creatures, are not abandoned. There is at least one who visits them. And if she visits them, it means that she loves them and has accepted the gift. And I anxiously wait for you to continue your visits in Bethlehem, the place in which I was born, and visit my tears, my pains, my steps, my works, the miracles I performed, the sacraments I instituted, my passion, my cross. In sum, everything. And I make you aware, if anything escapes you, that you may make your little visit, be it even in passing. And oh, how content I am that my apartments are all being visited. My daughter, what a sorrow it is to give and not to be recognized. To give and have no one who takes the good one wants to give. And do you know what I do? When I see you, all by yourself, going around throughout all my territories and visiting my apartments, I give you all the goods that are in them in such a way that what I should give to others, I centralize in you. So I give you everything, and you give me everything. In fact, in order to be able to give everything to the soul, I must find everything in her. And in order for her to be able to give me everything, she must possess everything. One who has everything 
has the capacity of being able to give me everything and to receive everything. Afterwards, I was feeling such profound sleepiness as to be unable even to write. And I thought to myself, why this sleepiness? When vigil has almost always been nature in me. And my beloved Jesus, moving in my interior, told me, My daughter, just as a doctor makes the poor patient who has to undergo surgery fall asleep, so as not to let him feel all the harshness of the pain of the cuts he has to make on the poor infirm one, in the same way, I, celestial doctor, who love you so much, in order not to let you feel the continuous press of my privation, its repeated blows, the harshness of its painful cuts, make you fall asleep, so that in breaking your martyrdom, sleep may give you a little bit of respite from a pain so intense. But while you sleep, your Jesus sustains you in his arms, and I continue my work in your soul. And not only this, but I make you sleep because my justice, too irritated by the offenses of creatures, may do its course in striking the creatures. And by sleeping, you may not only leave it free in its course, but may be spared the sorrow of seeing its just blows over the ungrateful world. Oh, if you could see how your Jesus embraces you delicately, so as not to let you feel the touch of my embraces, how I kiss you so very softly, that you may not feel the touch of my lips, how I keep repeating so very quietly, my poor daughter, my poor daughter, what a hard martyrdom you are in so that the sound of my voice may not wake you up. And how, without clamor of voices and motions, I continue the work of the kingdom of my divine fiat in your soul. You would not say any more that I no longer love you as before. On the contrary, you would say to me, Oh, how so very much does Jesus love me. And if he makes me fall asleep, it is so that I may not suffer more. After this, I was following the divine volition, and my sweet Jesus added, My daughter, in order to form a greater light, it takes more heat. Light and heat are inseparable from each other. If there is light, there must be heat, because the nature of light is heat, and the nature of heat is light. However, if one wants great light, it takes much heat. They are both equal forces, and together they form their life. Now one who does my will and lives in it, receives the life of light and of heat from her Creator. And as the soul thinks about my divine will, she forms the heat. As she speaks about it, she adds more heat. As she operates in order to fulfill it, she doubles the heat. As she walks on its ways, she multiplies the heat. And the light becomes brighter, stronger, and extends and expands more. 
So there is not one part of her being that does not spread rays of vivifying light. More so, since she possesses the source of the life of light, which is my supreme fiat. From this, you will be able to comprehend how creatures possess as much light and heat for as much contact as they have with my will and for as much as they try to fulfill it in their actions. And if it is not so, even if one sees them doing good, it is a good without life, without light, and without heat. It is superficial virtues that form a painted light and heat, and that when touched, are found cold, and without the good of a vivifying light that gives life. And many times the works without my divine will, on the occasions, reveal how they were nourished by passions and vices that were colored by that apparent good. Then he kept silent and I tried to abandon all of myself in his will in order to follow it. And my highest good, Jesus, continued saying, My daughter, in creating man, our divinity bound him completely to us. So his memory, intellect, and will were bonds of union his eyes, mouth, hearing, heart, hands, and feet were bonds. And if the creature lives in my will, as she places each of these bonds in attitude, she receives the attitude of the divine life. So she is formed and develops like a little plant that while possessing the fecundity of its earth, full of vital humors, watered with pure and abundant water, is all exposed to the beneficial rays of the sun, receiving its continuous life. Oh, how well it grows! How enjoyable are its fruits! How sought for, loved, and appreciated! In the same way, the soul, by receiving the continuous life of God by means of all these bonds that more than solar rays communicate themselves over each part of her being, is preserved as fecund earth, full of vital and divine humors, that more than blood flow within her. How well she grows! She is the beloved, the one who is sought for by heaven and earth. Her life, her works, her words, more than fruits, are enjoyable for all. God himself takes pleasure in enjoying fruits so precious. Therefore, how can you fear that I may leave you, if you are bound to me with so many bonds, from which you receive continuous life? You have reached the end of the Book of Heaven. Volume 22, Part 6 Fiat, 